G'day everybody and welcome to our story. A little bit different this evening. Well worth listening to. Um, stay with this for the next 25 minutes or so. I've asked a, a friend, Simon Domisol, to, to tell us our story, in a sense, and how our story in the 21st century sits with the story of the early church from the 1st century. I'm going to begin with a little bit of a, a Bible passage for you, but by way of introduction to Simon, this is a bloke who, who walks the talk, and he talks pretty well, as you'll discover. Uh, Simon's area of, of research and lecturing at college is in, uh, is in early church and in planting churches that catch that essence of what it was in that first century when the churches changed the world, when we went from being 120 or so Jesus followers to 3,000 and 5,000 and suddenly took on the Roman Empire and transformed the world as we know it today. And it happened from small churches, house churches, groups of Christians. So Simon is the guy who's, who knows about that from his research in China, his own work in, in um, Southeast Asia, where he is engaged a lot with small communities who serve the poorest of the poor and those in need there. Uh, he's also somebody who loves old Land Rovers. That's not part of the story, but I find that interesting. Anyway, let me read to you what he's going to be speaking from. We've been in Pentecost just recently, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I've been telling you, you know, what does the Holy Spirit do? It sends us out. Well, this is where it goes. This is kind of a follow-up to what happens on Pentecost. So Peter uh, has been talking to them. And Peter said to them, look, everybody, here's the bottom line. I need you to turn and be baptized. Jump in, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he told them all about God's call. And he continued to encourage them, saying, Save yourselves. This is a crooked generation and a difficult time. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day 3,000 more people to the church. And then... Luke, who writes the book of Acts, goes on to describe life in the fellowship of believers. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and of prayers. And awe and wonder came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Oh, this is a community I want to belong to. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people around them. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Here's Simon Gomesall. Thanks, mate. Good afternoon, everybody from Bells Caloundra. It is so lovely to be joining with you in your worship, uh, albeit via electronic interface. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be sharing with you today. I was very impressed last week watching Phil Smith share his Pentecost message uh, in his lumberjack shirt beside the crackling fire. Um, I presume, Phil, that was in your backyard, uh, but it was very atmospheric. I'm afraid I'm coming to you from a far less exotic location. I'm here in a little space that I've turned into a study. Uh, I'm sort of half underground here, tucked in behind our garage. But in another way, that's sort of fitting for what I want to share with you, because after Pentecost, the early church didn't meet in special or sacred places. To be sure, they sometimes gathered in the temple courts, which was really the only public meeting space of their day, but they mostly met where most of life happened, in their homes. And I'm so excited to hear about the way that life is evolving for you as a church at Bells and, and to hear of your commitment to empower and to equip everybody in the church, empowering everyone to be leaders in your own communities, to be pastors to one another, to live as missionaries in your street and in your neighborhood, and to challenge the constraining dependency that the church so often has on buildings and property seems to me that you are committed to being the church rather than just going to church. 
And I think that is absolutely essential for a church that wants to flourish in a COVID or a post-COVID world. It also means that as I reflect on the life of the early church in Acts chapter 2, you'll probably notice some correspondence between the way you do things and the way that things are described in the text. I'll be interested to see if that's the case. An English bishop of a former era once famously quipped, when Jesus or Paul visited a new place in Bible times, they normally started a riot. When I visit a new place, the bishop said, they serve me tea and crumpets. It's quite a telling statement, isn't it? I mean, it taps into the deep dissatisfaction that so many people in the Western world feel that somehow we have domesticated the Christian faith. Somehow we've so missed the point or, or perhaps twisted the point that we have created a very tame Jesus who simply doesn't measure up to the one that we find in the Bible. Our 21st century Western Jesus would never have cleansed the temple or pronounced judgment on the Pharisees or cursed a fig tree, which is of course the worst of all because it's so environmentally unfriendly. We can imagine Jesus reclining with his disciples at the Last Supper, but did he really spend so much time hanging out with prostitutes and terrorists and white collar crooks, which is essentially what a first century tax collector was? Would those people have felt as comfortable in our company as they did in Jesus' company? Not that he was tolerant, mind you. I mean, their attraction to him wasn't based on a liberal acceptance of their lifestyles, quite the opposite. His consistent word to such people was, go and sin no more. No, the, the difference was that Jesus, as people encountered him, they, they, they found an infectious goodness. Somehow when they looked at themselves through Jesus' eyes, they saw a, a potential and a hope that they hadn't entertained before. They spent time with him and instead of feeling judged, which we might distinguish from feeling convicted, and there's an important difference between those two things, the belief entered their hearts for the first time that perhaps they could catch some of Jesus' goodness and wholeness. On the day of Pentecost, that infectious goodness exploded. Pentecost was about an outbreak of powerful and potent goodness. When the Holy Spirit filled the disciples on the day of Pentecost, there was this epidemic of, of love. We, we know a little bit about epidemics now, don't we? Uh, imagine if we could be carriers, not of COVID-19, but of God's holiness and goodness and love and, and, and his infectious liveliness. At Pentecost, God breathed on the disciples. Thankfully, none of them were wearing face masks. Thankfully, they were obviously inside the 1.5 meter quarantine distance. Of course they were, as Acts, uh, where is it, 1725 says that God gives us life and breath and everything. Uh, in other words, God is as close to us as our very breath. And when he breathes, of course we receive. So Jesus breathed on the disciples he infected them with the life of the Holy Spirit, his own life. And instead of only Jesus having this sort of infectious influence, all of a sudden, all the believers were equipped with Jesus' love. Jesus' fullness of life became the normal Christian life. And ever since then, every generation of Christians has had to line themselves up next to the New Testament and ask the question, are we fulfilling all that God wants us to do or be, or are we missing something? Just this week, I had a, a conversation with someone, and, and look, this happens relatively often, and, and the, the person said to me, and, and I hear this again and again, look, there's nothing obviously wrong with my life, but I just have a deep sense that something must be missing. There must be something more. So just in case you're not familiar with the part of the Bible that today's reading comes from, the book of Acts tells the story of the first ever church, of what happened after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection and ascension, how his first followers organized themselves, uh, or more rightly, were organized and empowered and directed by God's Holy Spirit to begin a movement that began transforming the world. And that movement has continued to this very, very day. And last Sunday, Phil reflected on the events of the day of Pentecost, when God 
poured out his spirit on the first group of believers, uh, the first followers of Jesus. There were only 120 of them, but the presence of God was so real, so tangible, that in their midst, that 120 became 3,000 in a single day. 3,000 people responded to the first ever Christian sermon that was preached by the Apostle Peter, and those 3,000 signed up to be followers of Jesus. They agreed with the Christian message. They joined the Christian community. That was quite a good start for the church. I think you'd agree. Uh, when I preach, I'm excited if people are even listening, let alone having their lives transformed. So when those 3,120 people had repented toward God and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and received the Holy Spirit, when they had experienced and responded to all three dimensions of the Christian gospel, what happened next? Well, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, tells us in chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, he tells us what happens next. It's, it's a snapshot, but it's enough. Uh, he includes this little cameo passage that describes what life was like inside the church when it first kicked off. So let's just take a few minutes to go through the elements of it. The first thing it says in verse 42 is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, when you encounter the living God, when someone is filled with the Spirit, they become like a sponge. They want to soak up every bit of, of teaching and Christian input that they can. A lot of people will testify that when they first become Christians, they just read and read and read the Bible. They can't put it down even although perhaps just a few weeks before they found the Bible dry and boring and inaccessible. Often people who are very sick, we know, lose their appetite. And a sign of returning to health is that they become hungry. They want to eat again. And in a similar way, I think that when people come to life, when they, when they, when they um, are renewed and revitalized spiritually, they, they become hungry for information that will sustain the life that they've found. For the first church, that was, of course, the apostles' teaching. The apostles had been with Jesus. Uh, they shared what they learned from him and applied his teaching to the circumstances of people's lives. We don't have the apostles with us anymore, but we have their teaching written down. And so studying the Bible is a must if you want to grow in your faith. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, it says, and then next to fellowship. Now, fellowship here is something much deeper than the social uh, engagement that a lot of people experience in church today. And I'm, I'm thinking about life in a pre-COVID world as I say that. I was once at a reception where there were a lot of people crowded into a very small room and uh, I had a plate with some slice on it um, and a drink and I was carrying a couple of other things as well and I couldn't hold everything and eat the slice as well. So I had to put the plate down on a, a little table next to me where several other people had put their food as well. And I took a bite of the slice and put it down and turned to talk to someone near me. But when I went back for a second bite of the slice, it seemed smaller than it had been before. I thought that's curious, but I took another bite and put it back and, and kept on with my conversation. But the next time I reached out to grab my slice, I put my hand on the hand of someone else who was taking, uh, picking up my slice, thinking that it was their slice. We had both been eating the same piece of slice. And in essence, that's what fellowship means. See, in the New Testament sense of the word, if you sit down at a table and each eat your own food, that's social engagement or social connection or social interaction. But if together you eat the same food, that's fellowship. Not just to do the same things, but to do them, to do the same things together. It's a deeper dependence on one another, a deeper sharing of things in common. The difference between social interaction and Christian fellowship is the difference between a bag of marbles and a bunch of grapes. In a bag of marbles, the marbles are all together and they're in pro pro close proximity to one another, but they're all still independent entities. But a bunch of grapes that's still attached to the vine they're organically connected to one another, drawing their living nourishment from a common source. Next, it says in the text, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, this phrase, breaking of bread, was most likely an early nickname for sharing communion. 
but it wasn't like the practice that occurs in many churches of taking a little piece of bread and a little sip of wine. Um, they shared a meal together, which I've heard is your practice too at Bell's, and that's a wonderful thing that you do. And in the course of eating and drinking, they stopped and they took the time to remember Jesus' body and blood, the elements of his crucifixion, and they remembered the forgiveness and the restoration that Jesus accomplished on their behalf. And the text says they prayed. They devoted themselves to prayer. Now, prayer was at the heart of all of their activity. I don't think I've ever preached a sermon from the book of Acts that hasn't noted that prayer was just an assumed part of the fabric of the lives of the first Christians. I guess that makes sense. I mean, the apostles had spent three years living with Jesus. They talked to him every day. They listened to him every day. So after his ascension, they continued that practice. They talked to him. They listened to him. But instead of doing it in person, they did it in prayer. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air, as James Montgomery describes it in his classic hymn. The text continues in verse 42. It says, uh, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. When God is at work, it produces awe and reverence. The apostles continued the work of healing and transformation in people's lives that Jesus had begun. Actually, uh, that's not quite right. Uh, we might say Jesus continued the work of transformation and healing uh, through the Spirit-empowered apostles. Einstein once quipped, He who cannot be lost in wonder and awe is as good as dead. Awe is the willingness to acknowledge the working of God that goes beyond our limited understanding, that goes beyond our preconceived ideas, that goes beyond our comfort zone. To worship God is to be, in a sense, out of control. It is to hand the reins of your life over to God and trust him to be working out his purposes in and through you. Sometimes that will be in keeping with your expectations and sometimes God will work way outside what you assume is possible or practical or sometimes even right. The fourth century church father Gregory of Nyssa once penned the words, concepts create idols, only wonder grasps anything. And if you feel like the God you worship is a concept that you've mastered, who only operates within the parameters that you approve of, then I can pretty confidently tell you that it's not God that you're worshipping. If you think you have God in a box in your mind, it's not God in the box, as the old saying goes. We have to let God be God and approach him with humility and wonder and awe. Verse 44 says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone in need. Now, this was a further expression of the idea of uh, fellowship that I, I mentioned before. Now, a lot of people read this passage and they say, hey, this, this sounds like the beginnings of communism. But, you know, I'm pretty confident to say this, this wasn't communism simply because it was voluntary. Communism is an imposed pattern. The state dictates what will be given and how things will be distributed. This is people freely selling their property because they now saw as their brothers and sisters people who were in need and they felt they could help. And that's not communism, that's community. A free and generous giving of what we have to help others in need. Sometimes that's money, sometimes possessions, sometimes it's our time. Uh, or our words, or our presence, just being with someone in need. Now, having said all of that, let's just pause for a moment and hear the challenge of those words, because most of us have far more than we need. And we're normally pretty reluctant to share that with others. We believe the lie that we have to maintain a certain lifestyle, and so we, we give away tiny percentages of our income, whilst others have needs that could easily be met by what we spend on our luxuries. Someone has said that Jesus came to create a personal religion. Let me just spell that for you. P-U-R-S-E apostrophe N apostrophe A double L purse and all. But I don't say that to to make you feel guilty. I don't 
would, would never want anyone to, to give out of a sense of, of guilt. These people certainly weren't giving out of a sense of guilt. They were joyfully giving because they wanted to. They had a sense that they had received so much from God that the money and possessions that they used to value so highly and hang on to so tightly no longer really mattered that much. And so they shared them. Verse 46 uh, tells us that the, the formality of meeting and praying in the temple was balanced by the spontaneity of breaking bread together in their homes. Religion wasn't just a compartment of their lives. Their new faith infiltrated and flavoured every aspect of life. Public, private, uh, formal, informal. It, it was all just one. God was a part of everything. Like the Berlin Wall coming down in the 1990s at Pentecost, the wall that divided the sacred parts and the secular parts of our lives has come down and the integration of faith and the rest of life produced a, a freeing sense of integrity and consistency. It was all just so real. And they were very sincere. They were filled with joy, the text says, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And not surprisingly, the church grew every single day. But it was the Lord who grew it. As it says in verse 47, um, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, I can't make a church any bigger, nor can Phil Smith, nor can anyone, not by a single person. The only way we embrace faith is because whether we realize it or not, God is at work in our lives, rescuing us or saving us, to use the word that appears in the text. There is no other way to join the church unless you are saved. Now, just out of interest, the word saved here is a word that emphasizes that salvation is a process. It says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's a process that one day will culminate in a glorious completion. But for all those who quite accurately point out that churches are full of hypocrites and sinners, it's worth noting that salvation is a process. So we should never really have the expectation that church life will always be smooth sailing or some sort of wonderful bliss because the church is full of perfect people. The church is more like a boot camp where we slowly get fit. It's like a, a hospital where we slowly get well or a a workshop where we slowly are honed and refined. We don't lose all of our problems and issues the moment we start believing in Jesus. To say that we are being saved means that we are being changed, that we are being transformed. But for that to happen, God has to be put first. One of the first things I noticed in this passage when I read it a couple of days ago were the words all and every. Everyone was filled with all, uh, awe. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Every day they continued together uh, in the temple courts, uh, enjoying the favour of all the people. Those words, all and every, speak to a primacy given to the things of God in their lives. See, this wasn't a group who was squeezing God into their spare moments, giving him the leftovers of their time or money or energy. God had become the priority of their lives. And about 20 kilometres east of Jerusalem, at the very same time that these events were taking place, there was another community in which many similar things were happening. They were called the Essenes. And we know about that community because their writings have been preserved for us in what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. They also were a community in which prayer and fellowship was central, where everybody sold their possessions and gave to those in need. But as the Christian community was growing exponentially, the community of the Essenes was declining. They would soon fade away. And as the Christian movement vigorously expanded throughout uh, Asia Minor and Europe, the Essenes disappeared. And the contrast of decline and growth in the two groups, I think, can be explained by one simple difference. The Essenes sought behaviour modification by means of an external rule. The Christian community experienced heart transformation by means of an indwelling spirit. See, in the Essene community, there were rules and laws that governed the behavior of people who belonged to the community. If you wanted to belong, you had to commit to praying and you were required to sell your possessions. And I'm sure much good came out of that. 
but it wasn't transforming. It didn't change people's hearts. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, the difference between legalism in the Christian life and genuine holiness is simply the indwelling presence and work of God's Holy Spirit. The disciples in Acts 2, you see, weren't going through the motions. They weren't gritting their teeth and heading off to church again. Oh man, not another prayer meeting I have to go to. You couldn't keep them away from times of corporate worship and prayer. Now that might seem foreign to you. That, that might even seem a little bit weird, but it wasn't weird for them because they were full of God. They had been filled with the Holy Spirit. Everything they were doing was out of a response of love and gratitude for what God had done for them. One of the key words in understanding this passage is back in verse 42. It says they devoted themselves to a number of things. What does the word devoted mean? In Greek, it's proskaterio. Uh, but the word devote, our English word devote, is actually derived from a Latin word, devavare, from which we get the word vow. A vow is a promise of affection. Vows get exchanged in a marriage as a promise of affection, a promise of love. Devotion, therefore, is different to duty. Duty is when you do something out of a sense of obligation. Devotion is a commitment born of love and affection. And this passage, therefore, doesn't describe a group of people legalistically going through the motions of service and activity because it's the right thing to do. This is a group of people whose lives have been changed because they have come to realize that the creator of the universe is real and that Jesus Christ um, entered history as that creator and acted decisively in history to allow them to be forgiven by God and accepted by God and united with God in a new way. And that uniting took place when they were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. A process of transformation then began in their hearts and the outworking of that inner revolution produced a change in their attitudes and their behavior that began to change the world. Let's pray that that might be our reality as well. Will you join me in praying? Lord, uh, this afternoon we, we pray to you not as a God who is distant and far off, but one who is present with each of us at this very moment in our homes. You are with us. You are as close to us as our very breath. And we want to acknowledge your presence with us. And we want to pray, Lord, that just as the disciples had a renewing experience of your Holy Spirit, that we might do that as well. That wherever we are and whatever we're doing, we might in this moment just pause and still our hearts and open our minds and allow you to reveal and disclose yourself to us in all of the fullness that you want to, that you might so fill us with yourself that we we actually overflow. And, and out of that overflow, many people's lives are touched and changed and you're able to work and accomplish the things that you want to because you've first worked in us. Lord, we are imperfect people and we come to you often as as broken people, we are being saved. But we want to put our trust, not in what we can accomplish in our own strength, but in what you want to do through us. And you're only going to work through us if you first work in us. So Jesus, as we, as we engage in the business of this week, please be helping us to be aware of your presence, to be mindful of your company and your work in us. Help us to be tuning in to the things that you're doing and saying in and around us, that we can join in with you in participating in the life that you've promised to give to us. If we openly come to you, not in any capacity or strength of our own, but merely in weakness. And so we thank you for what you want to give to us. We thank you for what you've already done for us. And we commit ourselves, Lord, to serving you in all the ways that we can, which we ask together 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.